So let's jump into some Python. You guys have other questions before we start? So um, in the chat real quick, why don't you guys tell me on a scale from one to 10, how do you think your, where does your Python fall? What if somebody said 11? What, what would each number mean like, like on like to me, level of like? Bro, if you're even asking that question, you're like probably at a nine or a 10. No, I don't know. I mean, just, just a ballpark, man. Don't be embarrassed if you're, you're low. Okay, it's pretty good. That's good. So I know it's, I realize it's kind of a difficult question to ask. Um, nice. That's, that's great. I'm, I'm happy to see that some people will need the full. So as you can see, it's a very, there's a varying level of experiences here. So we have all the way from the bottom to the top. Christian, did you comment? There you are. You're an eight. Yeah. So, you know, some people are at the bottom, some people are at the top. So you'll have to be the best judge of what's useful for you. Um, but, you know, if it's boring, you can, I, I realize that some of you won't need this stuff. On that note, um, I guess we'll jump into it. Yeah, you ready? Woohoo! Nice. So I also wanted to let you guys know that if there's anything that you feel like you need, especially for those of you who um, are a little less knowledgeable about Python or maybe computer vision or deep learning, please feel free to reach out to me directly and I won't let you go uh, without knowing the material. So you don't have to get worried yet. I mean, we're still pretty soon with the material. But if you start to feel like you're getting behind or you're really getting overwhelmed, just let me know and I'll make sure that you can catch up. Okay. As long as you're putting in the work, you won't get left behind. So without further ado. So I updated this um, PowerPoint a little bit. I added a couple extra things in and I actually added a lot more in and then uh, it unexpectedly closed on me because I was trying to convert a video and it didn't save my changes. So we'll have to work with what we have. So um, what we're going to start with, we'll do some Python basics, uh, just useful stuff you'll need very frequently. Uh, we'll go through data structures and how to um, permute those and and some other operations on those. We'll look at loops and conditional statements, uh, some functions, classes, uh, also some useful built-ins. I, I think that was one of the things that got deleted uh, when it didn't, but we'll go over, I have it in another file. It's just not clean and beautiful like I would want it to be. Um, we'll go through uh, importing modules and packages and how to read from a file. Uh, NumPy is gonna be so crucial to it pretty much everything you're going to do. So the way you can kind of look at it is, um, from my experience, for the most part, everything before the actual deep learning takes place is going to be handled by NumPy. Um, as far as arrays and NumPy is considerably faster than a lot of the Python built-in packages. So you're almost always going to want to use NumPy over uh, a, a Python built-in. And then uh, lastly, we'll go through some OpenCV basics. Uh, OpenCV is, uh, was originally written in C++. It has a Python wrapper. It's a very, very powerful package. You can do almost a... Arushi, wasn't it you that was using OpenCV for some machine learning or...? Yeah, back in high school. I was using it too. 
So, so what do you guys, what's your experience with that? How did you feel about it? It's pretty intuitive, but now that I learn more about uh, computer vision for, as of now, I was yeah. just applying filters and extracting edges. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, I like it for, go ahead. Oh, I just like it for opening images. It's Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty much so. Honestly, the biggest part of the biggest, the most difficult part, in my opinion, of uh, building a functional working model and network, deep learning code, whatever you want to call it, is everything that happens before the deep learning starts. Um, you can find any kind of uh, neural network you want on the web and then just edit the syntax instead of three layers, you add four or something like that. But it's the data processing that happens beforehand that's often much more difficult. And that's where OpenCV is going to come in handy for us. So we'll look at some of that stuff. Let's see. So first up, um, there's not a whole lot I want to say about this. Um, you know, one of the big differences is here. So that it's, uh, you know, as opposed to like C++, which I don't know a whole lot about. I mean, I've written some stuff, you know, and you have these make files and you can create the executables uh, with Python. It's not so straightforward. Those things do exist, but um, you're going to have to interpret the code every time you run it. So, and then um, as far as, so these things here, and I didn't tell you guys this yesterday while Dr. Lobo was on, um, but remember how I told you about the guy who got the Netflix internship? So he has since gotten a job uh, starting at around, I think, 200,000 here locally in Orlando, which is low considered for the field. But uh, I've also known two other guys who graduated. One started at 370,000 a year, and then the other guy started at 400,000 a year. So, I mean, the, the salaries from this field are I mean, it's more than a doctor would make without all of this, the loans and stuff. So um, it's worth spending the time. So we've been through most of this stuff. Um, you guys can look back here um, for a reference. As far as, uh, so we talked about this. Um, I told you yesterday that Python comes pre-installed on your uh, Mac. Don't uninstall it. It can be dangerous. Um, and you guys can see here, like for example, if you wanted to just open a uh, command window, actually I'm gonna change my share from the PowerPoint to my screen. So give me one second. Okay, can you still see the PowerPoint? Yes. Excellent, thank you, thank you. Okay, so for example here, if you just wanted to, um, like if you opened up, you know, just a command window, and in here, actually what you can do is, sorry, let's move this. So uh, without even activating any environments, because Python is installed on my machine, you can just type in Python. So typically when you type Python, um, I say typically, without an Anaconda build on my machine, if I typed in Python, I wouldn't get Python 3, I would get Python 2. But remember how we installed Python 3? So when you install Python, or excuse me, Anaconda 3, so when you install Anaconda 3, it defaults in your uh, path to Python 3. So if you want to get out of here, you can just type quit and then you go back here. But the point of that is, is you have this interactive environment where now you can just type print. So in lieu of using uh, an editor, you can just type your Python directly in here. So everybody good with that? It's pretty straightforward. So just to um, reiterate, there is a difference in, in some scenarios, 
with these two things, okay? Python versus Python 3. So if your machine doesn't default to Python 3, then typing Python is going to give you Python 2. And Python 3 is going to give you Python 3. Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, and of course, Python files are .py. Mm -hmm. So this is not probably going to be super useful for you guys, but there is this online editor that I think is pretty cool. <clears throat> you can access it here. Um, in a similar manner to uh, Google Colab, it'll you can install all the packages on there remotely and you don't have to install anything locally. So that's a pretty cool tool. And then of course we've been through um, all the Jupyter Notebook stuff here. So I'm sorry about the editing here. It's not great, but you'll get the idea. It's in the notebook. So the first thing is, is that um, unlike some other languages, we use indentation instead of braces. So for example, you can see here I have this if statement and then a tab forward for the nested print statement here. So I don't need no braces because I'm a big kid now. Um, so you won't need those anymore. Uh, for strings, to define a string, uh, you can use single, double, or even triple quotes to, uh, to get a string value. Typically, um, you know, I stick with single quotes. That's a preference. Some people like double quotes. In my print statements, I always do single quotes. Um, but for the most part, it's almost always a preferential thing. However, there are some cases where you would need uh, double quotes on the outside and then single quotes on a command inside of those quotes. So for example, let's say you're in your editor and um, there's a built-in function in Python called subprocess. So if you wanted to use the subprocess command, what it does is it sends commands to your shell. Well, you have to put those in double quotes. But then if you want to put commands inside of those, you have to put them in single quotes. So it's a rare case, but uh, for the most part, it's a preferential thing. So as far as comments go, single comment line, you're just going to use the, um, the pound sign. For multiple comment lines, you can do it this way. However, typically this is, these are related for um, like the, uh, I forget what it's called, but like when you define a class and you want to explain all of the things inside of your class, typically you use comment blocks like this inside of there. But you can do it wherever you want. Oh, here's the formatted file. This is the correct one. Okay, so uh, for user input. So in Python 2, there was a difference between the built-in command, built-in functions, raw input, raw underscore input, and just input. Um, however, now in uh, Python 3, input is, takes the place of both of them. So originally it used to be with raw, raw underscore input, that was only characters and strings, and input had to be integers or floats or something like that. However, now with input, that takes the place of all of that. So you can see here in the notebook, um, if we run these cells, so if I run this cell, it'll ask me here, so it's waiting for that user input, so that's where I put in 60 cats. So let's say I only have three now, because I don't want to be the old cat lady. So, um, and here's some basic uh, arithmetic operations that you'll need along the way. So for the most part, I think this, this stuff is obvious. Um, but I put a couple things down here that won't, wouldn't probably be that obvious. So we define X and Y as integers, and then we define um, this as a float. So one thing to notice here is, for example, unlike C and C++, where you have to uh, define the types in advance, here it's inferred from the definition statement. So here, for example, this is now a float. And I could change this somewhere down here into an integer if I would like, where that's not true with other languages. So these are not statically defined. You can change their types along the way. So addition, subtraction, uh, those are obvious. For the absolute value, just abs out front that's a built-in for Python. 
Uh, multiplication is the single star. Division is obvious. Uh, if you want to do an exponential, you'll do two stars. If you want to convert a float to an integer, then you do int and vice versa. You do float. And then the part I kind of wanted to point out here is, is that uh, if you want to round something, you can use the built-in function round. Uh, so for example, we have y divided by x. So in other words, 2 thirds, 0.66, repeating. So one thing, the, the most important thing to note about this is that it's going to automatically, without any additional arguments, round up to the nearest integer. So for example, if you look down here, you can see it rounded up to 1. Um, on the other hand, let's say, for example, I had y divided by x, and I knew that I was trying to put this into, I was going to take that value, and I was going to pass it off to something else. And I needed that something else to be an integer. Well, in order to uh, achieve that, I would make int out here. However, I call this an inadvertent round because you're actually rounding that value, 0.66, but in this case, you're actually rounding it down instead of up. So this is a port, an important thing to note where that one could make a difference. Uh, and then lastly here with the round function, there are additional arguments. Um, you could, for example, I put 10 here, which means I want to round to 10 different places or 10 places. So you can see down here what we get. So is everybody good so far? Any questions? Good, okay. All right, so data structures. We'll start with lists. Um, so you can define lists. Um, for example, in this case, we have all strings. And in this case, we have all ints. And you can do it with an int, a float, and a string and see how I define this string with a double quote instead of a single quote. So it just kind of goes to show you the flexibility here. Um, and then as just kind of an aside, um, backslash n creates a new line, which you probably know that already. But in order to implement that, so say, for example, here I have numbers length. And then I put this um, backslash here in. And what that does is it takes me to a new line down here for numbers type. But more importantly, what happens, so if I want to know the length of my list, so let's say I want to know the length of, in this case, numbers. So you can use the built-in command length, L-E-N, and that will return three, of course. And then if you want to know what type of data structure is this, then you can use the built-in type for numbers. So again, we have a list here. And then uh, lists are mutable, so we can change the values whatever we want. So we've defined above uh, numbers to be two, three, five. But now let's say instead we want, uh, so this here is called indexing. So you want to index the second, which is really the third value. And you want to change that, which was five, to six. So we're going to print before the mutation, you have two, three, five, that's their original list. And then after you mutate it, I feel like 10, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Um, after you mutate it, you get two, three, six. So is everybody good so far? Yep. Nice. Okay, so from before we had numbers, I uh, remember we changed the list numbers to two, three, six. But now let's say instead of just three elements in that list, we want to add a fourth element and we want to call that seven. Um, so what we're going to do is use the append function. So print numbers, and one thing you'll notice that this is an inline command, so you don't actually redefine numbers here. Uh, if you do, it's not gonna work. So um, you append here, and now you can see the extra value. So instead now, let's say we wanna mix numbers up a little bit, and we wanna append a string. You can do that. So the mutability of lists allows you to put in whatever you want. So for example, in addition to just float, strings, integers, um, you can also append other data structures into the list. So here you could say, uh, I want to append this list into my numbers list, and you end up with this. So one thing to notice, and uh, this is a, a, an important difference in some cases, a very important difference in some cases. 
but that's the difference between append and extend. So here, ex extend appends each individual element of the list mixed, not the whole list. So for example, let's say that you don't want, uh, so see how we have a new list inside of our list? So this would be a sublist. But what if I didn't want a sublist inside of my list? I just wanted my list with the values from the other list that I'm interested in. So in this case here, uh, we stopped at this point right here. So this is what we had from above. Um, but now what we want to do is we want to uh, extend that list with the values from the list mixed. So if we look back here, the list mixed had these things in it. So when you extend the list numbers, you have four and see how it puts them out individually. I feel like I just said list about a hundred times and it's about to drive me nuts. Okay, so is everybody good with this? You see the difference? Yep, okay, cool. Okay. So one other interesting little thing here, and I'll add this in here maybe. So let's do, okay, so, um, did that one already. Okay, and so as kind of a, um, a special case, let's say. So let's say we do have numbers. All right, so let's define a new, so let's say you have a list um, of a single string. So let's just call it single. We have this. Hey there, okay. And now let's say what we wanna do is we want to append hey there to numbers. So let's, I mean, excuse me, extend. So let's do extend here and we wanna use single. So anybody wanna take a stab at what we think, what they think we'll get? Uh, the string hey there will be added to the list as a regular element. Okay, let's give it a shot, let's see. Oh, I guess I should print it, huh? Weird, it did it twice. Uh, is that because you ran it the first time and then you ran it again? Probably, yeah. It? Oh man, it just keeps happening. It's blowing my mind. <laughs> so let's actually do this just so I can um, eat this for. So let's say we have uh, new list equals. One, two, three. There we go. Okay. So you see how it um, added the string in, right? So now let's say, uh, so let's call this single List. Now let's do another one. Let's say we have single string, single string. And what we want is the same thing here. Just put in the string, okay? So now you can see here, um, so when we extend it with a list, it takes the element inside that list and it adds it into the list. So it truly extends the list in a very uh, intuitive kind of way. 
But however, if you extend a list with a string, you're not going to get the same effect. So in this case, you can see it actually splits up the string into all of its individual constituents. So does everybody see the difference here? So that's kind of an important little thing. Okay. Everybody good? Yep. Nice. Okay, so indexing. Um, so we now have this uh, list numbers, and this is what it looks like, right? So we appended this guy, and then we extended this on here. Um, so let's just say we want to index some of the values. So for example, if we were to index numbers at the zeroth element, of course, that's two. And then if we were to index numbers at the fourth, which is the fifth value, then one, two, three, four, five, you would get Z. Um, let's see here. So you can also index the sublist. So for example, if we wanted this element, which is the sixth element in our list, then it will return a list. But if we wanted to access the elements in the sublist, so we'll, what we'll do is we'll index numbers at the sixth element, and then whatever that is, we'll index at the first element. So in other words, whatever this returned here, we'll access at the first element. So this is where we get the B from. So as deep as your sub, sub, sub lists go, you can index all the way down if you would like. Does that make sense? Okay, so, um, okay, so in a list, if you wanted to access the last element of some list, so we have numbers, right? It's up here. And let's say you don't know how long the list is. So we don't want to count it. Now, what we do know is that it's five, six, seven, eight, nine elements long, right? But you don't want to type in, for example, um, you know, length of list equals len of numbers, and then go through that whole process. So you can actually index the last value of your list by just typing minus one. And this works its way all the way backwards. So you can do minus one, minus two, etc., just like you would in the forward direction, except you don't start with zero. So you wouldn't say minus zero. Um, so again, here's our numbers up here. So Let's say I wanted to take my list and I wanted to slice it. So in other words, I want to start at some point and finish at some other point. And those points may, not, may or may not be the end or the beginning. So for example, let's take numbers. Let's start at the third element and go to the end. So let's see what we get. What's important to note is that this is an inclusive slice. So for example, we started the third element. So zero, one, two, three. In other words, you start at the real third element. So you're gonna get seven back and it's gonna go all the way to the end. So when you leave this second location blank, it just goes all the way to the end and gives you the rest. Uh, on the other hand, if you were to leave the first part blank and go to some location, this is an exclusive. So, and I don't, I don't think they're called exclusive or inclusive slicing, but they do perform those functions. So whatever the number is on the second, in the second location or on the right side of the colon is gonna be an exclusive value. So for example, we wanna go from the beginning of our list, starting at two, to the third element exclusively. So really we're gonna take up to the second element. So we're gonna take zero, one, two as the indices, which is what we get returned here, two, three, six. Uh, and just as another example, let's say first you want to start at a certain element and you want to finish at some other element, then you can say one to three. And um, here's kind of a special scenario. So you can see that I have numbers and I have minus one to the end. And then I have numbers minus one. So the first one is going to return a list with a single element. So if you go minus one, then you're going to get a list with seconds in it by itself. However, when you don't use that colon and you access the last value, then you just get the string itself. Um, you can also use the minuses 
inside of the slices. So let's say, for example, you want to start at the second or the third element of numbers and you want to go to the very end. Um, now, obviously, you wouldn't need to do that because you could just leave this location blank, right? But this value may not always be one. So let's say you wanted to go from uh, two to the second to last element, then you could write minus two here. So if we do two to the end, then it goes to the, but let's see here, I wanna show you one thing. So if you'll notice here, see how the last element of numbers is seconds, right? So again, remember that this last value is exclusively included. So in other words, it's not. So the last element is not going to be here. So you don't actually end up with seconds in this value. And then you can do it this way as well. You can say, I want the minus fourth element to the minus first element. And then it will work this way. So this stuff can kind of be confusing. There's a lot of uh, nuances to the way slicing works. It's very powerful. It's fantastic. Um, but sometimes it's confusing, especially in the beginning. So that's why I've tried to include all of the little special cases that I could think of here. Um, one very important thing to note, and some people hate this characteristic, I personally really enjoy it, is that if you slice a list, so we know our list numbers is nine elements long, you can index that list to any number you want, and there's not going to be a problem. So you can see I've indexed to the 10,000th element, but it still just returns numbers from three to the end. So in other words, whatever number is here, if it's larger than the length of the list, it's not going to return an error. So if you're not careful, that could cause problems. Uh, let's say you thought you had a data set with 10,000 images, but there's actually only nine. It may not return an error for you while you're processing code, okay? Okay, one of the coolest and most confusing things uh, for new people, they're called list comprehensions. Um, so I'll show you down here how these are, these are equivalent to a for loop, um, but they're all in one line, which if you're as OCD as I am, one-liners are awesome. So, so let's define a new list. So we, let's say we have this list of integers, zero to nine. So it's a length 10, and here it is. So say we want to create a new list, which is comprised of the squares of these numbers. So in other words, I want a new list where I have zero squared, one squared, two squared, three squared. So I could write it out that way, it would take forever, it would be stupid. But for most of us, the most intuitive way coming from other languages would be to use a for loop. So in other words, First thing you do is you define an empty list that we're going to append to. You enter into your for loop, and then you append the squared value of each element from the ints list. So this is the most intuitive way to do it. So when you return that new list that you've created, you have zero squared, one squared, two squared, three squared. So this, is, this should probably be clear for most of you. Um, the syntax may be a little bit different, I realize, because it's Python, but the idea is the same for almost every language. So, but the better way to do this, instead of having to use a for loop at all, so you can see we have like a couple lines of code here, is to use a list comprehension. So for example, instead of defining that empty list the way I did before and then appending to it, I can actually do it all in a single shot. So here, So I define the same list. Um, so here you'll notice I called it square integers loop. And here I have square integers comprehension. Um, just as a quick note, I hate, I absolutely cannot stand the way variables like this look. But after you write thousands and thousands and lines of lines of code, and I mean, we all know the saying of like, you should always comment your code because you're going to go back. And it's true. It's absolutely true. But I mean, how many of us really do that or have the time to do that? 
writing your variables in a way like this makes Python in a way almost perfect because the rest of it's very readable. But if you're, sometimes if your var variables aren't named descriptively, then it can get confusing as they become uh, dependent on each other. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna say uh, n squared for n and n's list. So in other words, you can see it's truly just the for loop, but it's all in this single line. So this is gonna be a pretty standard format for your list comprehensions. Um, here you can see we get the exact same thing we had before. This is the one we had before down here. So now that may make a little bit more sense. So you can see here you put in some function to act on X, and then you say for X in something. So in our case, our function is to square the value for the value in a list. So um, let's see here. So let's define a new list. Let's say we have uh, a mix of in integers and floats, okay? Now, let's say we want to create a new list with only the floats from this list. So in other words, you want to weed out everything that's not uh, a, a float out of the get-go. So here we're going to say floats only list. So this is our new list. We're actually defining it, and then we're computing or creating it all in this single line. So we have n. Now notice, this is what's interesting, is that n, in this case, the function that acts on the thing we're interested in is nothing. In other words, it's like the identity function. You return the same value. n for n in that list. So that up to this point, it's completely normal. However, you'll notice I have this conditional statement at the end. Only take that thing if the type of that thing is a float. So in other words, what we knew before was up to this point, um, there's nothing special about this. But what's interesting to note is that you can uh, add these conditional statements on the end to increase the power of your list comprehensions. So does anybody have any questions about these? How about any comments from personal experience? Any interesting hacks, you know, for list comprehensions? So let me see here, I want to show you. Uh, let's see if we can come up with compre. Nope. Uh, list comprehension of lists. See what we get. So the point of what I'm trying to show you is that, okay, here's an example. So you don't need to worry about the second one right now. For those of you who know it, that's good. For those of you who don't, you don't need it right now. But what's important to notice is that you can actually do list comprehensions on list comprehensions. So in other words, you can nest these in a similar way that you would nest for loops. So we have, so it creates this thing and then it iterates over that thing. So let's see if we can get some other interesting examples here. Mm, nothing sticks out. But does anybody uh, have experience doing that? Any interesting um, list comprehensions you guys do? So there's so many, the deeper you go into, so for example here, um, the value, the value that you'll return is a list itself comprised of two elements. So you can do it in this way. Um, so there's a lot of options when it comes to list comprehensions. They're incredibly powerful and sometimes they're incredibly confusing simply because for all of us, uh, at some point it's like you're trying to imagine nested for loops in your head. So after you go a couple nested for loops in, you're trying to keep track of all of these things and what they are in your head and it can be very confusing. So sometimes instead of trying to write the perfect list comprehension, which is almost always possible, 
it's better to just maybe break it up into a couple different list comprehensions and compute those. Okay, so any questions up to this point? Okay. So next data structure up. So we've done lists, now we'll look at tuples. So a tuple is just like a coordinate pair from algebra where you have X, Y, but a tuple is not defined by the number of values that are in it. So for example, a tuple could be, typically they're referred to as an N tuple, where N is the number of values you have inside of those parentheses. So, excuse me, in Python, tuples are defined by uh, parentheses, and then everything inside is the exact same as you would define for a list. Uh, similar to a list, you can define um, different uh, data types inside of the tuple. And just like before, we'll use the, the length command to get the length of our tuple. And again, the type is a tuple. So um, you can index tuples in a similar way that you could index lists. So for example, if you wanted to index your tuple at the fourth element, well, the fourth element is A and you get A. So that makes sense. Uh, exact same as it was for lists. Um, as far as slicing is concerned, again, same procedure. There's nothing different than what we did before. However, everything is not the same with tuples as it was with lists. The primary difference being, so the question becomes, why would I ever use a tuple then over a list? And the reason is uh, to preserve data's integrity. So for example, if you have a tuple defined and you don't want the values inside of that tuple, you want to ensure that the values inside that tuple cannot be changed. They won't be because tuples are immutable. In other words, they cannot be mutated. So for example, just like we did with lists, let's say we want to redefine the value at the fourth element and we want to make it 100. Well, it's not going to work because tuples are immutable. OK, on to my favorite data structure, dictionaries. Um, Dictionaries are a little more advanced than tuples and lists. Not a whole lot more, but they're so much cooler. Um, dictionaries are unordered. So unlike lists and tuples, which uh, I failed to mention, but in context, it's important now that those things are not necessarily ordered. So in the case of a list, I mean, excuse me, they're ordered. So in the case of a list or a tuple, it's pretty safe to assume that you can index certain values. Uh, and you're going to get the value that you put into that. However, with dictionaries, there's no ordering here. So for example, you can't index into the zeroth location, the first location, et cetera. It doesn't work that way. Uh, dictionaries work in a key value pair structure. So for example, this is the key on the left side, and then this is the value on this side. So in other words, if I wanted to return this element, the two, then I would have to index it at its key, which is A. Um, so you can do uh, length in the same way that you did with tuples and lists. So in other words, the length of this dictionary is going to be four. Guys, give me one second. I'm going to let my dog inside because she's crying. Okay, she wants to learn some dictionaries. So, um, so in other words, as above, you can use the length function. It's going to do the same exact thing. However, there's some additional functionalities that were not offered with lists and tuples. So, for example, let's say you have this basic dictionary comprised of different types of data. Uh, and let's say you want to... Um, access only the keys from your dictionary. So you can use dot keys and you'll get A, D, 8, and C. You can see those here, A, D, 8, C. Or on the other hand, if you wanted to access just the values, then you can get just the values. And lastly, if you wanted to access all of the individual pairs inside of your dictionary, or you wanted to iterate over the pairs, for example, 
then you can use dot items, which is going to return as a list all of the pairs here. So now let's define a more advanced dictionary. So our basic dictionary had like single element data types, but now let's do some data structures inside of our dictionary. So inside of dictionary, let's see if I have this on the next slide. So inside of a dictionary, um, the key value cannot be a list or to, it cannot be another data structure, but the value can. And the value can be a nested data structure. So here you can actually have a dictionary of lists inside of this value. And those can be nested ad infinitum as deep as you want. Um, but the point of this is to show that, so you have some string, which is the key for a list, again for some tuple and lastly for another dictionary which is the one we defined above. So, um, so if we wanted to quote unquote index on this, on these dictionaries, um, so here they are again, if you wanted to see what they look like. So let's say for example, you wanted to index the basic dictionary that we had before. In order to do that, you have to use the key value, like I said, and it will return the value to and again, if you want to, so keep in mind, this is not the, uh, the ninth element in the dictionary, or this is, you know, because this is not the eighth. This means the key that you access a value. So it's just like a door, key, put your key in, open the door, you get the value. That's all it means. Um, on the other hand, let's say we wanted to access our advanced dictionary. So here, if you would uh, access your advanced dictionary at the list key, it's going to return a list. And similarly, if you access it at the dictionary key, it's going to return the dictionary, the values that were associated with that. So like before, where we indexed into something that had been indexed. So here, let's, in, let's index into advanced dictionary. And we want to index at the key dictionary key. So we'll have this whole dictionary here. Okay. But then we want to index inside of that dictionary. So you add another one of these guys and you write D. So in other words, this is the first key. And then on the second thing that gets returned, you index again with this value. And so that should return seven, which it does. Does that make sense? Dictionaries are awesome. I love them. Okay, so let's say we try to, uh, we try to return a value in our dictionary that doesn't have a key. So in other words, let's say we wanted to uh, index into X. So let's see. In our advanced dictionary, or what dictionary were you? Basic dictionary. So in our basic dictionary, the keys A, D, uh, 8, and C. In other words, there is no X, and it's going to return an error, as you would expect. However, you can use the... Uh, the uh, built-in method for this, that's dot .get. In other words, uh, it's kind of a testing method, like does this exist or not? So basic dictionary dot .get at that key, and it will return in this case none. So if you wanted to define some conditional statement on top of that, if this returns none, then try again. Um, so like dictionaries and unlike tuples, um, uh, dictionaries are mutable. So what do we mean? Um, so let's say we wanted to take our advanced dictionary and at the dictionary key location, you want to replace what was there with 11. So what was there originally was this basic dictionary that we had. But now I don't want any of that. It's too long and I don't want to read it. So we can replace it with a single element, in this case, an integer. So we replace that with just 11. Does that make sense? Yeah. Nice. All right, so I have a question for you guys. So for those of you who are pretty good at Python, have you seen anything weird yet that you didn't know about? That's good. Okay, good. So up next, let's define a new list with uh, a list comprehension. So in other words, instead of writing it uh, and hard coding it, let's write out a new list 
And this list will use this thing here, which is called the range. Um, just as a quick example, well, I can just tell you. So the range, the way it works is, it's basically going to return an iterable object with all of the integer values up to excluding this value. So in other words, the iterable that is returned from range five is zero, one, two, three, and four. So this is gonna iterate over that. So we've defined this new list. And um, what we wanna do is for item, so let me ask you guys this. So um, Pedro, what does this return? What is the list? My list. Uh, zero, one, two, three, and four. That's it, right? So, so what we're gonna do is now we're gonna do, um, we're gonna loop over, we're gonna iterate over my list. And the point of this is just kind of a, a, to show that you can iterate over lists, first of all. So you're for item in my list, and you're gonna go through it, zero, one, two, blah, blah, blah. But another thing I wanted to show you here is it's called string formatting. So the uh, modulo operand here, which I guess I should have included this on the arithmetic, arithmetic page or the arithmetic page. So let's see. So you guys are kind of like my guinea pigs. Okay. So here's the point. So what we want to do is for each time we loop through our, uh, our list, what we want to do is we want to print, do something for the percentage D time. Well, basically what's gonna happen here is for percentage D, D meaning decimal, um, a decimal value, it's not really decimal, but I mean, you just go with whatever they tell you. So there's some other ones, like for example, if I did uh, percentage S, string, that kind of thing, but it's gonna replace it with whatever's here. So you'll notice that one important thing to notice is that in a normal print statement, see you have this um, um, comma here, well, you'll notice when you use string formatting, you don't actually need to insert a comma on either side of the percentage sign. And so whatever's here is going to get replaced when it prints the string inside here. So you can see here, do something for the zeroth time, do something for the one time, etc. Okay. Um, um, so if you had multiple arguments, would you use the the percentage sign again, or would you separate it with commas after the percentage sign? Um, For example, if there was item one and item two. Okay, so let's do it. That's a good question. So let's make this slightly more complicated. Let's go down to our print statements. Okay, there we go. So let's run this cell, right? And then let's copy this cell. Let's paste it below. So now let's do this. So, um, so let's say you wanted to do something relatively simple like, let's actually put it in parentheses so it doesn't look like crap. Actually, I'm gonna do nothing first and I'll show you guys. Comma, percentage D. So let's say in other words, we want to include item. Then you also want to include item plus one. Okay, so let's see what this looks like. So for, in other words, Basically, when you want to include multiple values in the string formatting, you still don't need commas here, but then you just make a tuple with all the objects inside of it that you want to print over here. So, or you could even do it like, um, let's say we wanted to mix it up a little bit. So uh, you wanted to do this. No, 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 let me do this. 
So let's do a string and then let's do two of these integers here. So what string do we want? So we have to have them in order. So let's do the string i. So in other words, you can do a string, a decimal, a decimal, and you don't really need these parentheses here, right? Maybe I should make these square brackets so it's clear that there's something different happening. Okay, so you um, you can do multiple different objects along the way. Is that clear? Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, iterating over tuples. So you can do the same thing we did before. It's like iterating over a list. So lists, um, tuples are iterable objects, which means you can write a loop over them. Um, in this case, it's the same exact thing as we had before. Nothing interesting here. One interesting thing is, is uh, the enumerate function. So what that's going to do is, so for example, our tuple is comprised of easy as one, two, three, A. But let's say we want the index associated with each one of those values in its tuple. So we know it's 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. right? So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put whatever index value is returned for each item in the tuple. And in this case, I'm going to say item. Now, there's no significance uh, in the terminology here. In other words, index and item are not reserved variable names inside of Python, but I just use them to illustrate what's happening. And then I'm going to say enumerate my tuple. So it's going to return this pair of the index of that item and the item itself. And so you can see here when I print index, you have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then it's going to print the item as well. Um, iterating over dictionary, slightly more complicated, but not a whole lot. So let's say we have this basic dictionary here, A1, B2, C3. Um, so uh, by default, when you iterate over a dictionary, so for example, if I said for key, or you could just call it item, for key in my dictionary, what you're going to be iterating over, excuse me, are the keys of your dictionary. So in other words, you're not going to be getting pairs here. It's going to be individual keys. So I want to say the value associated with that key is defined by this statement. And so then here I can write the pair, the key value pair is A1, B2, C3. On the other hand, for example, if I wanted to iterate over the pairs of my dictionary instead of just the keys, then I would use my dictionary.items, which does in fact return a key and a value. So you can see it's shorter. So sometimes you'll want one, sometimes you'll want the other. And uh, additionally, what we could have done here is instead of saying dot items, you could have said dot values and it would have returned just the values, right? Okay, so functions inside of Python. Um, so this is kind of the general format here for a, fu a function. We're gonna have our arguments here, so parameter one, parameter two. And here you're going to have some stuff to do, and then you're going to return some value, right? So it's not super different than a lot of the stuff you would see other places. So let's say we want a function to define if something is true or false. So given some number, you're going to return, provide a number for me. And I want to find out, is that even or not? So the syntax is define, and then whatever you want to call your function with the arguments and then a colon. And then tab in, you don't have to jump straight to the return, but you can. And here we're going to return the number that you've provided, moduli, modulode by two, and ask, is that equal to zero? So unlike before where you've seen the equal statements above, uh, we use a single equality to define a value. However, this is uh, a testing a condition. In other words, when you say equals equals, it means is this equal to that return true or false? It's a bool statement. Um, so let's use our function. So let's say we want our number to be 59. And I want plug in 59 into my function, which of course is going to return false because 59 is not even. But whatever the value returned from my function, I want to use that for a conditional if statement here 
to do something or else do something else. So of course I can just say, and this is how I would print, hey, this thing is even or hey, it's odd. Is this clear to everybody? Super, super basic example, but um, you know, defining functions is gonna be super important for everything you're gonna do soon, so. So now let's use our function that we just find up here uh, inside of a list comprehension. So if you recall in the list comprehension, the first part of our list comprehension was a function that acted on some value from an iterable object. So in this case, we predefined the function. So here, let's say I have some numbers, 5, 18, 7, 9, blah, blah, blah. And I want to create a new list of just the evens from that list. So I'm going to use my function is even, which is going to return true or false, and then four numbers in my numbers. So here you can see that it returns the bool value for each one of those things. So if you wanted to actually return the values, you could do that too. But so. So any questions on functions here? Okay. So how long have I been going? Let me see what time it is. Three eleven. Okay, so let's take like a, like 10 or 15 minute break and I'll see you back soon, okay? All right. Brain break. Okay. Is that your dog? Yes, and that's why I'm taking a break because my wife left me here, took the kids somewhere, and the do and the door was closed to my office, and the dog's like outside crying, and I'm like so mad right now that I'm trying to act calm. <laughs> I'm like, why would you do that? I'm working it here. But I gotta take care of my sweet <laughs> puppy. So I'll see you guys in a couple minutes, okay? Sounds good. See you in a minute.
I'll go ahead. I'm back. I think I think I convinced my dog to lay down. So I was just reading these. The chat this is so good. <laughs> oh, my wife left me inside the kids. Oh my God, Pedro. It's so good. So unfortunately, I don't really like get notifications when I'm screen sharing about the chat updating. So, um, but to answer everyone's question, all of those guys I talked about graduated with PhDs. Oh, I forgot there was another guy who graduated and went to work for, um, it's called Innovative, which is the company that produces the Da Vinci robot, the Da Vinci surgical robot. Um, another one of Dr. Shaw's students before I got there graduated and went to Amazon and has been there four years and apparently is making like rumored 1.2 mil it's pretty, it's pretty nuts. So, all right, you guys ready? Who's here? Okay, I think that should fix it. Okay, so um, make sure everyone's here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Daniel Silva, eleven. Okay, good. So functions, any, any questions about anything so far? Good, okay. So next up are classes. So in other words, um, you know, we're dealing with object oriented programming here and you can, which when I started, I had no idea what that meant. Um, I wasn't sure what an object was, didn't know any of that stuff. You don't do that in the math department. But the whole point is, is that um, you're basically gonna build this thing. And in this case, let's call it a person. And this person will have characteristics about them. They'll have um, variables and functions associated with the class, which can be deployed at different increments of time or when called upon. So inside of a class, um, variables are going to be referenced by self dot variable name where self is the class itself so in other words you're assigning this attribute to the person um, outside of the class on the other hand if you wanted to refer to one of the variables inside of the class then you would refer to it by class name dot variable name so here we have a super basic example of a class um, but we're going to define a person and that person is going to have a name and an age. So inside of the init function, in other words, uh, this is like initialize. So whenever you, the words instantiate. So whenever you instantiate a class, it's like you bring that person into existence. So in other words, this person, John, was born at 36 years old. He was born right here. So when we instantiated him at 36 years old, he became a person and um, the only thing that he could do at 36 years old was when requested, he could say, hello, my name is John. That was it. So you can see here we have inside of the um, initializer 
function inside of our class. These are the things that are going to happen. Oh, these, these are the things that are going to happen as soon as you instantiate the class. So here um, you can see we have the arguments name and age and the word self always will go as the first argument inside of any function inside of your class. Um, one thing I don't have mentioned here, and it's a little bit more advanced, but in, <clears throat> excuse me, you can also define, um, you can make this class as a subclass of other classes. In other words, this would be the child and it may have a parent and it can assume certain attributes of its parents. Uh, a little bit more advanced, probably not uh, super important for you guys to worry about right now, but so the point is, is that when you instantiate John at 36 years old, we're going to call him 31. So it's this person that has these attributes about them. And one of the methods, that's the technical term, one of the methods that John has is he can say, hello, my name is whatever. So when you call that class, the object has now been defined as P1. And when you write dot my function, that's the function inside of the class that we defined before, it's going to return the value that either was returned or in this case printed, print to return something. So, hello, my name is John, and that's the end of it. So any questions or comments about classes here? I realize this is a very superficial uh, view of classes. No, okay. So for the most part, um, you would never you would never need a class. Um, I know some people that write in Python and they don't use classes at all. They just use functional programming uh, functions to do everything. Um, in general, classes make things cleaner, easier to work with, um, especially when you have a lot of attributes that apply to a certain object. For example, uh, one of the most important classes that you'll be building. Um, well, there's two probably, but the hardest, the most difficult one will be a data loader. So in other words, what you're going to do is you're going to build this object that returns your data set. Well, your data set's going to come to you in any various forms. Let's say it came to you as color images and you wanted to return them as grayscale images. Um, inside of your data loader, you're going to have to build a class that can read in the images. Uh, and then process them into grayscale and then return them as an object. So um, we'll go more in depth on the data loader later. That's the most difficult class that you're going to work with. Um, but it is important. It's very useful to keep it as a class instead of just function because that data loader is a single object. Um, the second class that you'll be working with primarily is uh, for your neural networks. So you'll be defining these convolutional neural networks inside of a class, um, which we'll get more into when we start learning about PyTorch. <clears throat> um, but that's to come, okay? So uh, just in general, this is, I would hope, obvious. Uh, you never know. But um, if you're unsure, obviously the first thing you should do is uh, you should Google, like the syntax type stuff. Um, for example, I know it's sub-job interviews. They're very particular about giving you quizzes and tests on like knowing, having memorized specific Python syntax, um, which of course, if you've been doing it a long time, you'll know it, but you know, usually that's what the web's for. You, you realize that there's some concept, maybe you were writing in C++ or assembly and you're like, oh, I, I remember this thing was called a go-to and I wonder if that exists in Python and you just Google it and you'll find it. Um, so I told you a little bit, I think, yesterday about the native debugger inside of Python, uh, the, the default bugger that comes with Python, or built in, I should say. Um, you can use that. I'm not going to go a whole lot into it, but basically the point is, is, so if you use the import statement, PDB, Python debugger, and you set a trace at some point. So you guys remember yesterday when we were in PyCharm and we put that red dot for the debugger? This replaces that object. So basically you would stop at the trace and then you would execute one line at a time after that with these different commands in S and C. So one other thing I wanted to point out here, I kind of just, I don't even know why I added this in, was um, 
Can you guys hear my dog? She sounds like yeah. she walked. <laughs> Poor baby. She's so cute. <laughs> She's so spoiled. She is so spoiled. My dogs are too. Oh my God, I call her the Princess of Genovia. <laughs> I mean, I just gave her two treats to get her to be quiet and she's still whining, so. Aww. Yeah. Okay, so remember earlier when we were, I was talking about um, string formatting for print statements and we used the percentage, percentage sign? Well, that was the original way of string formatting inside of Python. Um, there's more, there's been two updates to that structure since then. The most recent update is pretty cool, but it's not compatible with versions of Python, I think 3.6 and below. Um, let me see if I can find a quick example to show you. Um, new Python string format. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> So old style, that's with the uh, percentage operator. And then the new style, I'll show you in a second. But then there's this newest style. Okay, yes. Yeah, okay, just give me, give me one second, okay? Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so the newest form of string, um, I guess they call it interpolation, but it's string formatting, is that you put an F out front, single quotes, and then you get this thing, right? So basically, this is like everything inside of these single quotes is going to be printed directly, and then you use curly braces to format like we formatted stuff before. So um, there's also printing. You can write print F. Let's see if he uses that, this person uses it. Um, and then that will give you something comparable to the printing of that. But anyways, the whole point of that story is that you can use the percentage operator. I mean, like for example, in the first example that I gave you guys, I use percentage D and I was just string formatting one single object. And when you're doing that, that's usually for me the easiest way to do it. It's readable uh, and it's very straightforward and simple. The, the more recent, but not the newest string formatting method is you uh, use single quotes here and then wherever you have curly braces is where you're gonna format the stuff into and then you're gonna write dot format and put these things in there. So this can get very, very complicated because with these curly braces, you can also specify what type of data object is it, um, how many decimal places do you want, and all that kind of stuff. So you'll encounter this at some point. Okay, so um, importing modules and libraries into Python. So um, I'm sure you've seen some stuff before by now, but so basically, you can just import libraries by saying import library name, whatever that is. And then once you've done that, uh, later in your code, so for example, let's say we imported math. Well, if you import the library math, then you can call that library and a specific function in it by saying object name, just like before with the classes, object name dot function name here, okay? and then whatever the value is. Now, on the other hand, let's say you didn't want to have to write math dot 
XP every time. You just wanted to write EXP. So what you could do instead then is say from math, import that specific function. That's something specific I'm going to use and I don't need any more of the rest of the math library. So you can actually say from math, import that specific function, and then you can call that function directly. However, EXP will now be reserved in your namespace and you can't define other functions by that name. Uh, similar to the random, calling random. So from the library random, we want the function random. So here we say from random, import random. Now you can call random directly. Um, this whole statement here, basically like don't, sometimes it's very important to, uh, in particular with NumPy, to not try to write your own loops or functions that are gonna do something that NumPy could do in a single shot. And the reason is because you typically wanna vectorize calculations as much as possible. So for example, say you had two arrays, 100 elements in each one, all integers, and you wanted to add the elements from each array by their index. So you wanted to add zero index zero and add those together. And then add the first ones in each one, add them together. Well, with uh, NumPy, you can do that in a vectorized format, which means instead of doing one at a time, it actually takes them, lays them on top of each other, and adds them in that way. Plus, the um, numerical computations that NumPy uses are very advanced and very fast. So you almost always want to rely on that kind of stuff. Um, here we have some file handling type stuff. This is much more extensive than I have outlined here. But um, in general, what you want to do is you want to say, you can open a file. For example, typically, you know, like an, uh, a text document. So say we wanted to open some text document, and then you specify what you'll be doing when you open that document. So for example, if you want to open it as a reader, in other words, you can't edit, then you would single quotes R, and that would go right here. Um, same thing for writing, creating and writing, appending, you can, there's all kinds of options, right? But again, you can just Google them when you need them. Um, so typically, let me see here. Okay. So when you open a file, so let's say I, I'll just go do some here. Okay. Okay, so um, let's say typically the way you would do it is something like this. F equals, and let me put it. Okay, so you see how I'm in this directory here with Jupyter Notebooks? So I exited, executed from my, or I accessed this by way of my terminal, right? So wherever I was uh, here. So I changed my directory into this Jupyter Notebook, and this is after I already uh, changed my directory into that Python tutorial. So now I'm just going to take some random text file, and I'm going to put it in that directory so we can use it locally in the uh, Jupyter Notebook. So let's find a file. So let's put in the output text file that I gave you guys for the MNIST assignment. So we can just put that in here. Output dot text here. Okay, so you can see it just popped up here, output doc text, right? So let's say we want to open that. So F open single quotes for the string path name that we're going to put in here. It's kind of long. So let's define it above here. Okay. 
So we want to open this and let's say we want to open it as a reader. We don't want to edit or do anything like that. So typically the way you'll do it is you'll, uh, I guess you could say instantiate that object by defining it as such. So here, let's try running this cell and see what happens. So now, since you've opened this F, what's important is, is that it's going to be open along the way. And at some point you would have to close it. So you may want to read some stuff um, inside of that text document. So let's, let's do just that. So let's go here. Um, let's say this. So let's say we want to iterate for, uh, for line in F. Print line. Let's see what happens. Let's break after this because I don't want to print a million lines. using TensorFlow backend. That's not very uh, descriptive, but so let's go over here and let's look at our text document and see is that the first line of our text document and make sure because, okay. So the first line of our text document is in fact using TensorFlow backend, so that's a good sign. So it doesn't look like a very long text document, so let's not break them. Let's say, um, I'll leave the break there so we can learn about breaks, but let's say we want to Get rid of that and let's run this. Okay, so, so you can see it actually printed out all the stuff here. So each one of these lines it printed out as it came through. So is everybody clear on how that works? So the point of all of that is to, to be said is, is that now you have to actually close the file that you've opened. You don't want to just leave it hanging. So what you would say is f the object dot close. That's it. So now it's closed. So as an alternative, what you can do instead is you can say with open. This is kind of a weird one, but path. Let's do it as a reader. So let's call this first one f1. So now, so when you use this, this, uh, this command with, it's only going to leave the text document open inside of the nested section of its body. So here we would basically just replace everything that we did above for line and F2. Print line. And then we want to break because we don't want it all. Okay. Okay. But now it's not open. And I think there's a command that's like f dot is open. Um, is open Python. Okay, here we go. So dot closed, it's the opposite of what I thought. Oh yeah, I'm closed. So, okay, let's go through this here. So open it, boom, first line, go through this again, boom, it's closed. So the whole point of all of that is, is that sometimes you don't need to open a document or whatever it may be and keep it open in memory forever. Um, you can just keep it open inside of the nested section of that with statement and it closes automatically once you're done. Um, some other commands that are associated with the the open function, or I guess it's probably a class, but um, you can read. So that's one of the methods associated with it. So in other words, if you want to read all of the data, oh, look, we have closed here. I forgot about that. Um, you can read the size and you can read all of the lines 
into memory at one time. So as opposed to what I just did, I read one single line at a time and I replaced it as I went through. So for line in F2, so line here in memory is getting replaced, updated each time. So in other words, you're not reading this entire text document into memory. Here, on the other hand, you're actually reading the entire thing at one time. So any questions about that? Um, JSONs, JSON files um, and pickles. Pickles are less interesting. JSONs to me are awesome because they're comprised of dictionaries. Um, oh, we don't really need to go over this. You can refer back to this if you need to, or you can ask me if your project you're working on has some more stuff to deal with JSONs and pickles. They're just two types of uh, files that are used to store data. And um, you can read it here, what it has. But is anybody specifically interested in going more in depth with these? Okay. The whole point you would use either of these are there are cases in which um, they can store data in a more efficient manner than storing something as just like a plain text, for example. So, NumPy. Um, I think I've said most of this stuff. Yeah, this, I didn't say the sister library for Scientology. It's, so NumPy's sister library, which depends on NumPy, is called SciPy. Um, So the way you would install this inside of an Anaconda environment is just Conda installed NumPy, but it comes installed default, so you shouldn't have to do that. Um, one of the more confusing things about NumPy arrays are the dimensions. So for example, like a 1D array, that's very straightforward. Like you can imagine a list of numbers, uh, and then that's the zeroth axis. What's strange is you're gonna say that if you were to print the shape of this NumPy array, it has shape for comma blank. And in some instances, depending on how you call the shape, you may just get the number four. But um, that's very intuitive. I mean, that's something we can all sink our teeth into. This is considered to be the zeroth uh, axis. Again, when you move into a more matrix-like format, you have this second dimension, which we're going to call the first dimension. So in other words, this is basically like saying you have uh, two rows of three. Totally can sink my teeth into that. And then you start getting in these larger dimensions. So here, this is like saying uh, with the, the three-dimensional array, it's like saying you have four three by two matrices. Again, not super complicated. However, these dimensions can continue on. So for example, when you have to say you have 10 of these, it becomes impossible to uh, conceptualize what's actually happening here. Like as a human, we can't imagine this is the fourth dimension. So you will encounter those things, uh, especially with your data loaders. So for example, you'll have an image. Let's say you have an image. Um, it's an RGB image, and let's say you have 100 of them. So let's say the image is 100 by 100, and you have 100 of them. So in other words, you would have a tuple here. The shape is 100, which means that's how many you have of them, and they're each 100 by 100, okay? But then you're going to stack those on top of each other, those tuples of three. You're going to stack those for the what's called a batch. And the batch is something that you're gonna pass into your deep learning network. Um, that's where things start to get a little bit more conceptually difficult. So uh, you don't have to completely understand how it works because it's actually impossible. So sometimes it's confusing. Uh, one important thing to note, and I don't have a note here about this, I don't think, I think I have it somewhere else in like a PyTorch tutorial or something, but I'll say it now and I'll say it again. When you pass something, for example, um, from NumPy into PyTorch, the order of the dimensions is not the same. So for example, let's just take a look here. 
NumPy versus PyTorch connections. I'm gonna get out my little drawing pad because I may need that, I don't know. Overhang, this is not it. So let's say, um, let's say we want to do PyTorch uh, 3D convolution. So, so this is, we're not there yet. So don't worry too much about it, but 3D convolution as opposed to 2D convolution. So 2D convolution, two dimensional convolution doesn't always, but you can imagine it like this. Uh, when you have a neural network that needs to act on a data set of images, then you're gonna have a 2D convolutional neural network. However, if you have a neural network that needs to operate on video, well, what is a video? A video, is nothing more than a sequence of images, right? So say you have a video that's comprised of 10 different images or frames, if you will. You're gonna have a, you're gonna have a third dimension because you're not necessarily gonna pass each one of those images into your neural network individually. Because what you're trying to capture in a three-dimensional, or excuse me, yeah, three-dimensional convolutional neural network is sometimes the depth of your video. In other words, what happens over time? So in an image, you have like this spatial orientation and you wanna process the data and interpret what's happening there. Is there a dog or not? Is there a cat? Yes or no. On the other hand, with videos, you're trying to process things over time, like action classification. Well, an action is not something, by definition, action is a, a verb and the word verb means time. You have to do time to have an action. So over those 10 frames, what you're gonna to try to do is interpret things. So like I said, that's not, um, did you guys see what this said? It was funny. You visited this page many times. That's funny. So let's go here. Okay. So again, I'll, uh, can't stress it enough. I'm sure most of you already know in the event that you don't, the documentation sometimes is so good to rely on. There are, of course, packages and libraries whose documentation sucks, so you can't rely on that. But in general, it's you know where you want to be. Okay, so so briefly, um, so the reason I bring up PyTorch here is because uh, that's probably what we'll be using the most. And while the dimension ordering may be different than NumPy, the ideas of dimensions the idea of dimensionality is the same. So um, let's see here. So we don't want 1D, let's try. Okay, so here's an example. So for a standard image, you're gonna have the height and the width, right? That's your X and your Y, that's very straightforward. Everybody knows that. Uh, and a doctor, I don't know if Dr. Lobo or, or Dr. Shaw said this or not, but um, just so we're on the same page, every image that you have is nothing. So here's your image. And let's say we have 100 by 100 image. What that means is you have a 100 by 100 matrix. And each one of the cells in the matrix is comprised of some value, typically something from 0 to 255. Um, where zero is black and 255 is white. However, uh, when that's for a grayscale image or just uh, like a black and white. So in the case of a black and white image, we have 100 here, we have 100 here, but here you would only have one what's called a channel. So in other words, when you have that, so you have 100 by 100, but there's no depth, depth to it. There's no idea of colors along the dimension. So you only need a single matrix comprised of values from zero to 255. That's how you're gonna get a black and white image. But if you have what's called an RGB image, a red, green, blue image, 
it's going to have three channels. And when we say channels, that just means matrices of values from zero to 255. So you're going to have one matrix that's going to be for the red. You're going to have another matrix that's for the green and you're going to have a third matrix, which is for the blue. So in the case of a RGB image, you're going to have a hundred by a hundred. And here the channels is going to be three, one for R, one for G and one for B. And then lastly here, this, this N means how many of those images do you have? So you can see here, we already have three dimensions, which is kind of weird to think about, but it's not, so, it's easy. Okay. But then when you add this fourth dimension in, it's difficult, especially if you try to conceptualize it to me from a mathematical point of view, the best way to look at it is like this. This first value is how many you have of these things. Is everybody good with that? In other words, you have 10 of these things. Okay. Now, Let's add to this. So this is for 2D convolution. So in other words, if you want, these are dimensions that apply to images, okay? But now let's move on to 3D, which means now we're gonna be dealing with uh, video, okay? So you can see there's some numbers the same here. Um, so you're gonna have the height and the width, just like we did in our images, but now you're gonna have what's called a depth. And the depth for a video is the number of frames deep that you're going to send into your neural network. So now you have a third dimension here automatically. Now we still have the channels because they're each one of those images are RGB. So you have a three here as well. So as, as I'm saying, you cannot conceptualize this, so just don't do it. But you can look at it in a kind of a intuitive kind of way like I have in of these things. In other words, in this case, I would have, uh, let's say N was 10. I have 10 video clips. Everybody good with that? 10 video clips. So yeah. the moral of this story is, is to not get caught up. So that's why in a way these pictures are kind of uh, dangerous, if you could say, because if you start to try to focus on it from a, a mathematical uh, or a, like a physical understanding, it's not gonna work, so. Okay. Um, so inside of NumPy, you have different functions that will allow you to just create default arrays. So for example, um, earlier we had this, uh, import NumPy is NP, that's what everybody uses. Don't call NumPy NumPy, because some people do and it drives me nuts. I mean, why would you, NumPy? So. So, okay, so the point of this is that you can define matrices with certain function calls in the NumPy library. So in this case, uh, I call a NumPy and I wanted to find a matrix of ones. There's other ones like zeros or the identity, which is E-Y-E, -E, like I, I. Uh, and inside of the argument, what you're going to do is pass in the dimension of the array that you want to return. So in this case, that's why I call it a matrix because I'm going to return a three by three matrix comprised of entirely ones. Does everybody feel okay with that? So if you ignore this five here, in other words, what I just uh, defined is a matrix where this is a one instead. So then what we can do now, and this is, uh, where things can get a little bit more complicated. And this is why I harped so much on not trying to like conceptualize the dimensions is because when you start having to, to index into a multi-dimensional array, it can get very confusing if you're trying to imagine this spatially. So here, remember earlier, uh, if you were to cover this one up, then we're doing indexing the same as we were before. But now we have these two values, it's like a tuple, but it's inside of our indexing section. So the way this is gonna work is basically what this is saying, I want to index into the first value, I guess it's the second value of my zeroth axis, and I want to, uh, where's my pen here? So I want to index into the second value of my row, and the second value of my column. See what I'm saying? Now this can, 
get much more complicated. And I don't know if I have it here or not, but at some point we'll talk about it. Um, but this is how you can index into a multi-dimensional array. And you could do this if, there, if you had four dimensions. You index each dimension and then separate them with commas. Is everybody comfortable with that? Cool. Okay. Um, so inside of NumPy, you can use, you can call on the function dot shape, and that will return the shape of your array. Um, you can also define arrays directly instead of like calling on another function like ones or zeros. Uh, you can define an array directly by saying numpy dot array. And then inside, instead of, you'll notice up here, the dimensions were passed in as an argument with parentheses. On the other hand here, we're gonna pass in the array itself with square brackets. So here, if we were to print the value of vector, it would be one, two, three, that's it. Um, there are things like the dot product or other things like that inside of um, NumPy. We're not gonna go too much into that. This is pretty important here. I don't know how much you guys will use this or not, but it is important. it's important to note that there are um, these conditional operators inside of NumPy. And sometimes the documentation in my experience is not super great, but they're very powerful if you can utilize it properly. Uh, so in this case, you're gonna say numpy.all. And inside of that statement, you're gonna pass in a conditional statement that says, so basically whatever the result is, this is an array, you wanna take the absolute value of that array, which takes the absolute value of each individual element. And then for all of the elements in that array, how many of them are less than 15? And then I want to do NumPy all of that. So since the absolute value of all the elements in the result is not less than 15. So in other words, are all of those things absolute value, <coughs> excuse me, less than 15? Well, what is the result? Let's take a look. So result is here, and you can see it's 7, 16, and 9. So are all of those less, less than 15? No, they're not. So this is not, you know, like a list comprehension, but in the same spirit of being a one-liner, you can nest these NumPy functions inside of each other to create some powerful uh, computation stuff. Another one I'm thinking off the top of my head is <clears throat> NumPy where. That's a very popular one. So here, again, you can say NumPy where, uh, and then you write your conditional statement inside. And so it returns the elements chosen from X or Y, depending on the condition. So let's look at an example here. So let's say we define this, um, this array. And so remember earlier when we used the, uh, the function that returned an iterable, which was range? NumPy has something similar, but in this case it returns an array. So A range, and it's gonna return everything from zero to nine. And then you're gonna say, in that array, wherever A is less than five, return A itself. Otherwise, if this statement is not true, then you're gonna return 10 times A. So let's go through the array real quick. So A less than five, true, so you return A. True, blah, 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 true, 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 true. And then when you get here, it's not less than five anymore. So you're gonna actually have to take this value, multiply it by 10, and return that value. Um, there's other ways you can use it, but in general, I think that's the, the idea that you know about that it exists is a, the most important thing. Um, if, when you need to use it, you know it's there and you can look it up on how to be more uh, detailed with it. Does anybody have any questions about anything? Okay. So here's just a couple more examples. Um, I told you about uh, the zeros function, ones we've already seen. The only difference here is now you have a three-dimensional array. Um, like I said before, the dot i is the identity matrix. So here you would get a three by three identity matrix. Um, there are different random calls that you can create arrays with. So for example, in this case, you're gonna create a two by four array of random values. That's where this random comes from. 
And by using this random here, you're saying, I want those values to come from the uniform distribution. Um, again, you want random values, but now I want them to come from a normal distribution, a Gaussian distribution. So you can specify what the, uh, the mean and the standard deviation and the size are here. And then there's some of the, uh, what's called broadcasting. It's like the replacement of arithmetic operations on arrays. So as I told you before, you can vectorize those calculations and these are much quicker. Everybody good so far? Yep. Okay. Uh, and a lot of array instead of making a copy of it. Um, I don't know how super important, I mean, I haven't really used this a whole lot. Here's the point. So, and I'm sure it's this, the case in other languages, but the point is, is that sometimes instead of operating on an array, you want to make a copy of that array. And then in turn, there are certain things that you can do to even the copy that will affect the original. So we're not going to go super in depth with that. It has to do with like kind of global operations and stuff, but there's a second form of copy and it's called deep copy and deep copy makes a copy that can't be edited by performing operations on the original or vice versa, whatever. Um, so earlier I showed you how to convert a float to an integer and vice versa uh, to do that with a NumPy array to convert all of the values inside of an array to, for example, in this case, an integer, you're going to use this as type, which means assert the type. So in other words, whatever values are in my array at present, I want to assert their type into integers. So now you have an array comprised of integers. Um, something else that's very important sometimes is we'll be given an array that's of a certain shape, but we don't like that shape. In particular, when you're going from NumPy to Kiros or from Kiros backwards or to PyTorch, vice versa, sometimes you'll have to reshape these arrays. Um, so you can do that here. So instead of having a two by four, you can replace that with blah, blah, blah. Um, just some other functions that you should be aware exist. So you can concatenate objects. So let's say we have array X and array Y, and I want to concatenate them, which means put them next to each other. Well, if you have, let's say, it's easier to, to imagine. If you had two arrays that were matrices, well, do you take the matrices and do you put them together like this, or do you put them together like this? So by specifying this last argument here, access is equal to, you're telling that I want it like this, or I want it like this. Um, you can be even more explicit by saying V stack versus H stack, which removes the need for the call on the axis. So you're telling it, hey, I want to stack it vertically. Hey, I want to stack it horizontally. Um, in my experience, using commands like this, uh, if you don't use it for a while, then you may not feel super comfortable using, you know, oh, what axis do I need to stack them on top of, blah, blah, blah. It's always a safe bet to print the shape of your data after you do something like that. In particular, it's important with data loaders. And that's because you can build this beautiful data loader that appears to be putting out exactly what you want it to. And even to the point where your neural network doesn't complain about it, but maybe you're passing in data that's completely wrong and you don't know. So especially in the beginning, it's really important to just print shapes, to print types along the way to make sure that you're getting the correct shapes and types. I guess that's the end of this one. Mm -hmm. So here's, I want to go through this one a little bit. This guy was the guy who did RU uh, the year before me. I think for the most part, I have most of this stuff, but let's just make sure.
Um, so I guess we can probably do a little bit of that. This will be more enjoyable than getting lectured to. So let me ask you guys this. Does everybody have um, everything working? Arushi, were you able to get your problem fixed with the Jupyter Notebooks? Yeah, so um, I actually had to uninstall SciPy, NumPy, and everything because um, you have to uh, import this thing called no MKL before you install that, or else um, that, uh, or else there's multiple, whatever MKL does, Apple already does it. Hmm. So on Mac, you need to have that setting on, and that's by porting a library. Before. Okay, so what year is your Mac? Uh, 2015, maybe, or 2017. Because hmm. I have a 2015, and I've never, and let me ask you this. Well, <laughs> and you're doing, are you still having problems? Okay, so when you were importing, what gave you a problem? Okay, let me go back to the error. Why don't you share your screen with us and we'll look, okay? Yeah, sure. Spencer, how are you doing, man? Hanging in there. You hanging uh, in there? A really good lecture. What's that? It's a really good lecture. I'm enjoying it. Oh, thank you. That's nice. I can see my screen. But basically, when I was fitting the model, I, I mean, I fixed it now by. Okay, so just give everybody a little context on what you're doing here. Yeah, I, I'm getting the terminal open. Let me see if I can pull up the error. So you're working on the uh, MNIST assignment that I gave you guys? Uh, the one assignment zero. I was just trying to run it. Yeah. So everybody, that's what she, so she's in PyCharm. She's trying to run the, um, the Python notebook that I posted with the MNIST assignment. Okay, here. So I was getting this error. Here's the exact error message. Ah, yes. So this area. OMP, initializing whatever this is, mm -hmm. but it's already been initialized. Weird. So it throws an error whenever that happens. And it says that you can do, uh, you can set a flag. Um, ah, you can set the environment variable, KMP to true. I did this and it worked, but it also said that this doesn't, like this might cause the program to crash later on or mm. produce incorrect results. So I had to figure out whether there's a alternate way and use this as a backup option. So then I had to, uh, I found online that, um, let's see. Um, so has anybody else encountered this error? Um. Yeah, I haven't either. Yeah, really weird. So, and then over here, um, someone said that this is a solution. Okay. Um, and this is like one of their reasonings, MKL. It's not supported by Mac, or at least like Mac already activates um, this package, the, the OMP package. So then I, I uninstalled SciPy and all those things, installed uh, no MKL. Yeah. With, and then, uh, then I reinstalled SciPy and then like my Jupyter notebook broke and then I had to reinstall IPython, I think. And then it finally worked. Okay, so awesome characterizing example. Um, and it's probably not gonna be the last time that we see errors like that because especially with OpenCV, um, the order in which you install things 
is very important. So here's an example. So you're going to install, you're going to create a new virtual environment. Um, and that virtual environment is going to install NumPy by default. And then you're going to install OpenCV, but it's going to require a different version of NumPy. So it may downgrade NumPy to what it thinks or what, to what it needs. But then you're going to go try to install PyTorch. And then when you try, try to install PyTorch, it's going to require the version that was originally there of NumPy, but that version doesn't work with PyTorch or with OpenCV. So the, this is one of the biggest drawbacks of Anaconda to me, but it, I don't know if it's a solvable problem. Maybe it is, I don't know, but the order in which you install things sometimes is so key. So sometimes if I installed OpenCV before PyTorch or vice versa, one would work and one would do nothing. So has anybody else experienced errors that are like that in general? Oh, also one thing to add is that when I was running it, I think there's like a small error because, uh, well, I fixed it, but over here, uh, apparently, oh, I think I'm not sharing anymore. <laughs> over here, um, this is apparently not allowed anymore. It's a, it's. Oh, in Keras? Uh, yeah. So th yeah. this isn't allowed anymore and it gives the wrong result. But you can do list comprehension. Nice. So you solved it. Mm -hmm. Will you post the uh, the line change that you made into the sure. that would be awesome into the thread of assignment zero. That would be great. I'm trying to look at my uh, at my when I executed my Jupyter notebook. If I got any problems, I don't know why, but I have absolutely no problems with that. Doesn't show up as a problem. Like it's not like it doesn't run, but uh, when you look at the plotted pictures, I mean the MKO, it's, huh? The MKO thing. Oh, that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, okay. So to me, overall, it sounds like a path variable is not working correctly. So let me ask you this: When you run Jupiter from your terminal, um. So, for example, when you say Jupyter Notebook in your terminal, can you show me the line immediately following that? Can you share your screen and show us the two lines immediately following that? Um, sorry, which part? So, in your terminal, when you typed Jupyter Notebook, or when you in typed terminal. Okay. I'll kill this. Yeah, so wherever you type Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, oh, where I typed, like previously? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can use command okay. up arrow and it will go to the next line where you um, at, at the time where it failed, right? Correct, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. And this so is like the virtual environment that I'm using, are you? Interesting. So let's see. Uh, Jupyter Notebook. The port 88 is already in use. So let me compare that to what mine says. Um, so the first line that I got right after typing in Jupyter Notebook, I got Jupyter Lab Beta Preview Extension loaded from, and let's see if this path is similar. Uh, Anaconda 3, library. So when you see your path, interesting. See how yours says Jupyter Lab extension loaded from? Mm -hmm. Huh. So mine is says- yours running on a, uh, like uh, in a virtual environment? I didn't run it in a virtual environment. So that's because this is running in a virtual environment right over here. Mm, yeah. 
Okay, well, if you solved it, that's good. So if anybody else comes across this problem, now you know who to talk to. If you haven't seen it yet, then you probably won't see it. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so good. Um, so, or who else has something they want to talk about? Okay, so I guess let's just finish this part. Let me share my screen. Just want to make sure there's nothing in here. So so who has, uh, I know Christian, you said that you had experience with OpenCV. Who else has experience with OpenCV? Oh, I have a bit. That was you, Matthew? Yeah. And Arushi, yeah, that's right, I know you do. Anybody else? I have a little bit as well, Spencer here. Okay, Spencer. I've used OpenCV pretty extensively in a lot of projects. Okay, good, good, good. Well, so let's do something together here. Um, let me actually, So when you uh, Windows users like see the Mac people share their screens, are you like getting jealous and stuff? <laughs> uh, no. I'm kidding. I'm like such a, I, I tell Arushi, I'm like, I'm such a Mac fan, which is funny because I used to like be a Mac hater. And then when I started using it, I fell in love. Me too. I was such a Mac hater, but you know, this is a superior technology. Superior technology is the exact right way to define it. What do you Mac people have to say about that? You want to talk some crap? Uh, Windows just announced they're putting a bunch of updates to kind of get the Linux crowd. So they like updated their terminal. So it has uh -huh. like, like Linux support now. Interesting. Native. Yeah, they're really revamping it. You know, but in general, for me, it's just like a Mac is where function meets form. Like a lot of PCs, especially, you know, in the past, I mean, obviously they're trying to get better, but a lot of PCs, they just, and of, of course this isn't a Microsoft problem per se, but they're just not sexy. But when I look at a Mac, it's like perfectly formed, magnetic closing lip. You know, you plug your charger in and it just kind of seems to char hook up itself without doing anything. And just the little things like that. But the one thing is the trackpad. That's like game changing. So let's all do something together. So you guys have, um, so let me create, so let me try this. So um, Pedro, we'll start with you. I need to create a new Conda environment so I can pretend like I'm starting from scratch like you guys. So what would I type to do that? Uh, I didn't memorize the command. That's okay. <laughs> That's PowerPoint. okay. Under create. There it is. Yeah. Let me ask you guys this. Does anyone know how I can, in the, uh, in the grid view, when I'm sharing my screen, of how I can show more people? Because I want to see everybody. Uh, can't you just drag the window to make it slightly larger? Try that. <laughs> Didn't work. Not on my end. It's very annoying. Mm -hmm. You have know. to drag it by a lot. Mine's not even draggable. Oh, there's a little thing mm -hmm. in the corner. Oh my goodness. Oh my God, there's everybody to meet. Now I can see you, buddy. <laughs> I, oh my God, Jenna, you're here. I didn't even know. It. Wow. <laughs> so good. Okay, good. So, um, all right, wait, I haven't heard from you in a while, man. What do I, uh, what do I type to get a con environment? Uh, Conda activate. Okay, so that's if I wanted to start it. 
Oh, let's say I want to create one. Anybody? Give you a hint. It starts with conda. Create. So here's a nice Linux command, by the way. Uh, control R, and it will allow you to reverse search terms in your history, in your bash history. So let's say, for example, I want to do conda. Unfortunately, I deleted mine, so there's nothing there. But so, who has no experience with uh, Linux? Just wink like this if you don't want other people to know. If you're embarrassed, okay, it's good. Yeah, so that was that was me. So I completely understand. So let's do conda create the name, let's call it R-E-U. Oh, let's call it, I'm an R-E-U. And we want Python version what? What did you guys do? 3.7. 3.7, okay. And I'm gonna type that anaconda thing here at the end because I want all of those packages to install by default. <coughs> So has everybody installed TensorFlow and Kiros so far? Yeah, okay, good. Um, I know, Jenna, I, I don't think I answered your question. You asked if you could see assignment one. I have no problem releasing that stuff to you guys. It's just a matter of like compiling all of the information. So <clears throat> um, I'll do my best. I mean, I have like, what I gave to people last year, but some of it I wanted to put together better. So it looked more professional, you know, cause last year maybe I just shared code with people and stuff. So, or even still, I was able to kind of explain the assignment to people or something along those lines. So, um, so this could take a while. So let's try some other stuff here. So, oh, nice. Warning, a new over, don't care. Do I want to proceed? Yes, I do. So um, at the place I currently live, I have uh, gigabit internet from fiber. And it's so much better than the like 50 megabits per second I was getting at my old house. Does anybody else have gigabit? I wish. Oh, yeah, that's so good. Is that um, AT&T? Yeah. And it's, it, it's cheaper than what I was paying before. It's like oh. 60, 60 bucks a month. So as you can see, all these packages that are installing, and I know I said this before, but just as a, another reminder, if you ever do need to create another Conda environment, uh, for example, we created this first Conda environment, and that's kind of like your default. Um, you can use that for a lot of different stuff. But let's say you wanted to create one for a very specific task, like uh, whatever your task may be that I guess it's irrelevant, but you may not need all these packages. Let's say, you know, you're never going to use this new environment you create for Jupyter notebooks. So you may not need all of those packages. So like I typed before, don't type Anaconda at the end of your creation and it won't install all of this. It, it installs almost nothing, which is, and it's much smaller because these environments are like, I think like five to 10 gigs each and that's not even the the anaconda distribution itself that's just the environments my god there's so much so last year when i taught ru i actually um had two other people help me they taught a lot of the classes so that's why a lot of the presentations I have like aren't completed. 
So I guess while we wait on this, let's do something else. So we'll come back to this. I want to do some open CV stuff. That's very important. Um, but there were some other things I wanted to show you in this guy's presentation. And this guy's given tasks and everything. So these are some very good commands we can go over here. Um, so all of these are uh, built-ins for Python, the minimum and the maximum. Um, but two very important ones, which I didn't know existed when I started, uh, were are argmin and argmax. And they have their equivalent in Python. Uh, but who can tell me what argmin does, for example? It finds the index that minimizes the value of the array. Precisely right. So in the array, there's some smallest value or the minimum. And we want to know the index of that value. And so that's what argmin and argmax are going to do. Um, I'm kind of of the belief that as long as you know, as long as somebody tells you that something exists inside of Python, uh, whenever the time comes that you need it, if you need it, the light bulb will pop on and say, hey, I could minimize this much code with, by doing this, and I could make it substantially faster computationally. I remember that function you know, that so-and-so told me about. You may not know how to implement it directly, but as long as you know that it exists, that's the important part. Um, so there's some other things that are really, really important that we'll use. Um, for example, os.path.exists. So let's say, for example, let's try, this is almost done. But let's copy the path of some image here. Shorten it. Okay, so let's go um, Python. And let's define our path as um, that. Okay. So that's our image path. Everybody with me here? All right. And now we need to import the package OS. Okay. Operating system. Um, and with that package, you can do a lot of cool stuff. So, for example, print. Um, actually, let's define it individually. So let's call it exists is equal to os dot path dot exists. In other words, this is going to tell us if that thing exists or not. True, sure. which should be true because we just copied that directly off of the. Um, you know, the desktop. Um, some other interesting ones are, for example, join here. So let's say, let's define another string and let's say our string is, so let's do string one is equal to ABC. And then let's do string two and let's call that uh, one, two, three. Okay. So we have these other two strings. Now, of course, you could just produce a new string by doing something like this. Uh, new string equals string one plus string two. I'm so lazy because I'm always using an editor and it like does everything for me automatically. Okay, so as you can see here, I simply added those two strings together and I produced a new string, ABC123. So the question is, is if I had two paths, why couldn't I add something onto a path? 
with the plus sign. So for example, let's take our path. So let's try um, new path. And let's just add new string to it. Okay, so you can see the path that just added the ABC123 to the end of it, right? However, um, you're not always guaranteed that what you're going to produce is a valid um, path. So, for example, in this case, this is not a valid path. And when I say valid, I mean like this. So let's define um, newest path like this. os.path.join. I want to join the same things that I added together up here. So path and new string. Okay. Okay. So you can see how you see how it added the forward slash here. Um, and I can tell you right now. I'll tell you the truth. I'm not a hundred percent sure why the addition of two strings, excluding this fact right here that you get this forward slash. I'm not 100% sure why the addition is not always the same as os.path.join. But here's what I do know for a fact, is that I spent days after having done this, creating a new path, or new paths, and passing them into an open CV to read image, and it didn't, it didn't work and I couldn't solve the problem. And in the end, all I had to change was os.path.join. And now somehow it was like a valid type of path that worked. So I can't explain it, but I do know that uh, just in general to be safe. You know, this is a nice command. So there's some other commands here that are good. Uh, is file, list all of the directories inside of something. So for example, let's do that. So let's say, my directories and then we'll move to OpenCV is equal to um, OS dot, what is it, list directory, I think. Yeah. Okay, so let's list directories, but what I want to do is, so I have this string here, okay? Can you guys see this string? What I want to do is I want to list all of the directories inside of my desktop directory. But the only path that I currently have is this PNG thing. So, any ideas? There's multiple ways. I I would just split that on all of the all of the slashes, and then join, join them back together. Yep, you could do that. That's a good way to do it. Anybody else? So let's try this. So in general, uh, in general, split's a better problem using things of that nature. Um, split, strip, stuff like that, which if you don't know what they are, that's okay. We'll come to it at some point. Um, but in this case, we can actually count the number of characters there is until we want to get back to our location. So PNG, three, image, three, so that's six, period, seven, and I, I can get rid of this forward slash two, so that's eight. So what you can do here is you can actually say, I want from the beginning to the end of that, okay? So you see how I minus the last eight things off? Did I say eight or, I don't know, let's just try and see what happens. See? So that's cool, right? So it lists all the paths inside of there. Uh, and sometimes just as important is that sh you can actually now determine how many are in there. Um, and then I'll close with this one last thing. So without hidden. Okay. So now what I have is, are my directories, right? So you're, what you're going to do is pretend like this is a directory and it contains all images. Uh, and with those images, you're going to build this data loader and you're going to do some stuff, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I, I can't speak for uh, Windows machines, but I know on Mac, 
that every directory has this hidden file DS store, okay? So my point is, is that you may be loading a directory of images and there may be hidden files in that directory that you didn't want. So what you can do is you can, so you can say, I have all these directories, right? But I only want the ones that aren't hidden files. So you can use a list comprehension and you can say directory for directory in my di directories, if directory, uh, if not, directory dot starts with, I think this is it, and you want to put a period. If not, directory starts with. All right, let's try that and see. Anybody see any obvious errors here? Okay, great. All right, so you see here how this has the DS store in it. And then you can see that I use a list comprehension to remove all of the things that are hidden inside of it. And now the DS store is not there. So the takeaway from this message is that um, obviously there's no way, unless you already know, that you're gonna learn all of the little functional commands and stuff like starts with blah, blah, blah over the course of the summer. What I do hope to do is to either tell you or provide you with code that will have most of all the little specific things that you'll need. I mean, there's no way I can tell you all of the little commands, but I can tell you the ones that I've used the most extensively in my time here, okay? So these are some examples here. Um, if you want me to copy and paste this and send it to you, like you can uh, send me a, a DM text or chat. Let's go back to our um, cond environment over here. All right, so we got all this stuff, so let's get all that out of here. Um, okay, so now I want to list all of my cond environments, and I forgot how to do that. Conda, let's just try this obvious one, cond environments. Nope, conda list environments. Is it my lucky day? No. Um, did you try just conda list? Uh, that will give me all of the packages in a single environment. But I want to see all the, the list of all the environments that I have. List environments. Here you go. Oh, I see. It might be conda env, env list. You might. You're probably right. It's, so, it's something like that. I know that. That's not the one I want. That's too complicated. Let me try. Conda cheat sheet. Conda env list. I think that's it. Do we have a winner? Yeah. Chicken there? Yeah. That that's just worked it? on my. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Conda env list. Okay. So these are all of the um, environments that I've created. So that's another important command, conda env list. Um, but again, you don't have to memorize all that stuff because that's what the web is for. So wouldn't worry too much about it. So anyways, you can see I just created this and I saw, uh, here's this one, I'm an RU. Okay, so I'm gonna pretend like I'm an RU. I'm gonna say source activate, uh, I'm an RU, okay? Okay, so now I'm inside of this environment, right? And so now what I wanna do is conda list and we're gonna look at all the packages I have installed because what we're about to do is to install some other new packages. So. Um, you guys already have TensorFlow and Kiros, right? But you can see up here, um, L-M-N-O. Oh, so in other words, no OpenCV. That's the point. So a lot of people use Pandas a lot. It's really good for like uh, data manipulation, like CSV tables and stuff like that. I personally don't use it a whole lot. Um, but it's machine, it very machine learning important. Uh, Arushi, have you used Pandas a lot? A lot. <laughs> a lot, yeah. So some people, it's funny, some people, I swear they, they like, swear that that's the first package you should learn. I've hardly touched it, but I don't know. Okay, so now let's say, uh, let's install some other stuff. So maybe to replicate your experience, I should install Conda install 
Was it just Conda install TensorFlow directly? Right? Yeah, or dash GPU. Okay, actually, I'm probably gonna skip that step just simply for the sake of time. So let's try to now, uh, let's first install OpenCV. Okay, so let's, let's do just that. So, Honda install OpenCV. I highly recommend that you always check this before you do anything. See this, like so many people are gonna have had problems with it. I can't explain to you how many times I've had problems. Really important note is that, oh, you're like, oh my God, finally I found a working solution. It has a lot of thumbs ups. Well, keep in mind that this was first of all in 14, edited in 17. So between those years even, that's a lot of people could have thumbs up it. The mempo repo does not work anymore for me. Um, so, we're just going to do what we can and see what happens. Okay, so this is usually the one I try first, I think. So let's try that. So um, does everybody, can everyone see that command? So for those of you who haven't installed OpenCV, go ahead and uh, try this command in the environment that you created. Can you just paste it in the Zoom chat? I will. That's a great idea. Thank you. Okay, you guys see that one? Now this one takes a little bit to install. So we'll see. And I wanna, what time did I, what time did we start back? I only slept for three hours last night. I'm so tired, but I'm putting on a good face. You said 325. So. 325. So we've been going for like over an hour and a half. Yeah, about exactly an hour and a half. Okay. So why? Um, so let me ask you this: Who already has OpenCV installed? Let's try that in the environment that you created yesterday. Um, was that in the PowerPoint? It was not in the PowerPoint. Oh, then I don't have it. Okay, okay. So why, why don't everyone, why don't you guys try this command, uh, install OpenCV, and let's meet back. I don't wanna do a whole lot more today. Um, in our next session, let's kind of do something a little short and basically to something I can set you up with to kind of like work through on your own a little bit. Um, and in the meantime, also think about what other stuff you want to focus on um, because obviously the virtual aspect adds some dimensions that are a little bit different um, in some ways it's it's less personal so people aren't as direct and uh, about what they need so whatever you need because a lot of the times like for example in the reu you go kind of in the direction of what people need so i want you to be open with me uh, and you can just message me in slack with what you know what kind of direction you need and I'll do my best to navigate the group in that direction. Okay. So um, execute this code here and then let's meet back at 515. Good. That sounds good. All right, stay strong. Okay. Oops.
Hey, you guys ready? Yep. Was that a yes or no? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. Okay, Kelly, you're back. Good. So let's get back to it. So who was not able to install OpenCV? Mine hasn't finished yet. It still says solving environment. Mine too. And who was, Callie, what kind of machine do you have? PC or? Uh, yeah, PC, Windows. Okay. And then who was the second person? Was it you, Audrey? No, I got mine. Okay, who was the second person? It was me. Jenna, yes. So <clears throat> you're on PC as well? Yes. Okay, so Tamik, did you try it? Oh, me? Yeah. Yeah, I worked. And I, worked. I can import it and stuff. And what kind of machine are you on? Uh, PC Windows. Okay, hmm, interesting. Joe, how about you, buddy? So I did it on, so I have my main computer and then my laptop. On my laptop, I'm getting a permission error, even running it through an administrator. Mm. So I'm not sure about that. I'm trying to look it up now. The other one worked perfectly fine, both windows. Um, Pedro? Yeah, I got it installed. OK. Uh, Christian? Uh, yes, I, I got it working. Excellent. Arushi, did yours work? Um, so I installed it, but I'm just testing it right now. Okay. Um, Matthew? Yep, everything worked. Everything worked. Good. Audrey, where are you at? Yeah, I got mine. Okay, Way? Uh, it says it found conflicts, and now it's examining all the packages. And are you doing this inside of your virtual environment? Uh, no. So you definitely want to... Okay, so here's the thing. Um, open CV. So can you guys see my terminal window here? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So here I did. So I did conda install from the channel conda forge open CV. I'm a little surprised to tell you the truth that it worked as well as it did. Cause usually it seems like it's not as good. So actually, sorry about that. Oh my God. Stop being so annoying. Oh, well. okay, so. Um, collecting package metadata, done, I'm on a Mac. Solving environment, done. <clears throat> um, blah, blah, blah. So here's some important stuff. Okay, so the following packages will be downloaded. Um, it's interesting. I don't see. So we'll go to the next part. The following new package downloaded. The following new packages will be installed. So in particular, this guy right here, FFmpeg, is an incredibly powerful command line video and image processing tool. And that is what OpenCV is built on top of. And as well as a lot of these other codecs, containers, drivers for the stuff that already lives on your machine. So that's in part why I'm guessing you guys probably are getting um, conflicting errors or dependency type errors. Um, you can see here, this is kind of what I was talking about earlier, the following packages will be updated. So it's gonna update some of my packages. Arushi, I found this interesting. Uh, it's editing MKL. And then again, JPEG, I mean, you can see like these are like super fundamentally basic packages that your computer probably already has on it, especially probably uh, you Windows users. These things were, were born out of Windows. Um, MKL random. So again, here we go. The following packages will be superseded. And then again, 
the following packages will be downgraded. And this is important. So the NumPy base was downgraded. So it seems like mine went through fine, right? So it downloaded, everything went done, done, done. I haven't tried it yet. And then even more importantly, the next thing we'll do is install PyTorch and see what happens after that. So um, for the people who had errors, let's try to attack that. So can anyone tell me an alternative way to install packages? Pip. Mm -hmm. Pip. So <clears throat> if you'll recall yesterday, I told you that when Anaconda can't see, and this is exactly the package I was thinking of when I told you guys, when Anaconda seems to have problems with dependencies and stuff, um, inside of your Conda environment, sometimes you just want to try pip install OpenCV. So let's try Googling that to see if maybe uh, that solves the problem for some of you who So you can see here in a similar fashion to what we found with Anaconda, um, you find this website and it tells you what to type in. So um, in particular, Jenna, why don't you try this? Are you still having problems with your stuff? Yeah. Okay, so why don't you try this command instead? So um, Joe, why don't you try this on your permissions problem machine and I want to I want to see what happens there yeah I'm trying it already okay uh, who else had problems way I know you had a problem but you weren't in your virtual environment I had a problem Allie yeah yeah okay it why don't you try this like it works okay it looks better than the last one yeah I'll send you a screenshot but it looks like it worked okay that's good that's good mine only took like 15 seconds, but it looks like yeah. it. Is. Okay. Daniel Silva, what about you, man? Are you here? Yeah. Um, I, I've already had OpenCV installed on my machine, but just to okay. note, I've always installed OpenCV with pip. Like, I always have trouble using Conda, and this pip OpenCV dash Python always works yeah. way smoother. So I knew some of you would have to use this, so I had this in the tool bag ready for you. Um, for those of you who, for those of us who, it seemed to work inside of um, Honda, all the better. Let's just test it and see what happens. So now what we'll do is, because we're gonna be dealing with images and we wanna see those images, we wanna visualize them, um, we're, gonna, and we're gonna leave the, command line and we're going to return to a PyCharm editor because that will allow us to display our images. So if you would open PyCharm. So when I first started, Daniel, I had the same uh, MacBook that you do, the 2012. And man, that thing was a trooper. It made it through so much of this stuff, like all the editor and the anaconda. I mean, because this is a lot of strain on your machine. Okay, so <clears throat> I've got PyCharm open, and what I'm going to do is I'm gonna, let's create a new project. Um, what do we want to call it? Anybody? Crickets. So let's try, um, <coughs> I don't know. Let's try environment testing. How about that? Environment testing. Okay. And then don't forget, you're going to want to change the project interpreter. So this is very important. So if it's not def already default populated here, you want to drop this window, uh, menu down here. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Is my screen frozen on that really weird page? Yeah, I think it's frozen. Hmm. 
Because you said you dropped it down, but it's not dropped down. And it's not dropped down on my end either. Oh, you're, yeah, your face is frozen too. <laughs> of course, it had to be on that really weird face. How frustrating. So I don't know why, but like my computer has never froze. And then with Zoom, it's freezing. Unfortunately, guys, I think what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to join the meeting from my phone and then as the host to keep it going. And then I'm going to have to shut my machine down because it's not working. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. So just bear with me for a minute and I'll be right back. Okay.